All right. So um, thanks everyone for joining us. Welcome to the first of an eight part series on uh, the Workers' Council from Commune to Autonomy. Um, with uh, We are Red May Seattle and we're here with Jasper Burns, who's going to be leading us through this series. Uh, we're all really excited. Um, and yeah, thanks again for being here. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with uh, Red May, um, we're sort of a, a left-leaning lecture and art series that uh, happens both in person in Seattle and for the past couple of years has been happening largely online uh, throughout the month of May. Um, and we've also branched off into more year-round programming through a podcast called Cinderblock uh, that Sean and I primarily run. Um, you can find some of our stuff on Patreon, which is at patreon.com slash Seattle. We also have our redmay.org website. Um, and um, we're also, we're on Twitter at Redmay Seattle. Um, we are really excited to be hosting this with Jasper, um, who has been a friend of Red May for a long time. Um, a couple of like housekeeping notes with how we're going to run the Zoom rooms. Uh, we're primarily going during the Q&A, we will organize that through um, Stack in the chat. Uh, so just write Stack um, in the chat and we will uh, track the order and try and get to as many people as we can. Um, like I just said, we are, uh, we're not going to be keeping the recordings of the Q and A. So we will cut those out and we will upload the subsequent recording onto YouTube. So for those of you that can't make it or couldn't make it for this round, um, you have access to the video. You can watch it again, all of that. Um, let's see. The, I think the next date that we will be all meeting together is going to be November 13th. Um, there were uh, the sort of the live Google doc that has the readings um, as well as some of the subjects for each of the sessions is going to be a living document. So that will be updated. Um, Jasper will update that in terms of making sure that the readings are up to date, but then also with next dates for when the, um, when the next sessions are going to be. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to the outside agitator himself, Jasper Burns, take it away. Thanks, Kyle. And, uh, thanks to Red May for helping with this. Red May has been a really crucial uh, institution, I think, for the last several years. Um, and I'm really, you know, thrilled to see all of you here and a bit overwhelmed by the, the interest in, uh, in this project. And I hopefully I can live up to it. Um, I just wanted to say a few things about the, the series I had envisioned uh, and say, first off, that I, it's really kind of open to adaptation um, as we go on and you know I'll change things if it seems like they're not working uh, but the idea was that uh, people could on their own or with others read these texts a couple of weeks before uh, meeting online uh, and then you know at least for the first few sessions I can kind of give a talk and pose pose some questions and we can all come together to discuss here. But this also allows people to participate at different levels. Um, you know, you could just come to these online events or you could just go to the reading group. Uh, you could do your own video lecture series if you want it. Um, so, you know, I really um, hope that, uh, and I'm hoping that other people will, you know, volunteer to, to present here as well as we go on. Uh, and as much as possible, I want to, you know, uh, make this somewhat interactive and, and uh, hear from all of you. I think that's difficult on Zoom, uh, but I will, will do my best. Um, so I guess I'm going to now get into talking about the material uh, for today. Uh, and then I'm going to, at the end, I think um, we can have general questions and answers and, and people who are in uh, reading groups and we'll talk about what they uh, discussed then or invite other people or make general announcements. Um, we can do that then. But I wanted to say uh, something about why we're starting with the commune, uh, the Paris commune, because I, that might not be obvious. Uh, and so I, I begin the study of the workers council uh, with the Paris Commune because partisans of the Workers' Council look back to the Paris Commune as much as the 1905 Russian Revolution, which gave us the Council of Soviets um, for the origin of 
this new political form. As you will see, key elements of what Marx calls the communal regime reappear with the Soviets and the workers' councils, both as practice and as prospect. For Paul Matic, um, and I'm gonna here try to share my screen so that you can. So uh, for Paul Matic, the commune represented the first advent of a new force of proletarian self-organization involving proletarian than purely intellectual or academic visions of achievable communism deducible from the facts of class struggle itself. Once disclosed, such facts can't be forgotten and will be rediscovered by class struggle from whose experience uh, asthmatic rights. Otherwise, that in the case of the intellectuals, there results another statement of problem and new perspectives are opened. In this way, conceptions are formed, conceptions by proletarians are formed regarding the regulation of the mutual relations of human beings um, <laughs> in human beings and social production, conceptions which to the intellectual elements appear incomprehensible in which they declare to be utopian and unrealizable. But these conceptions have already unfolded a powerful force in the revolutionary uprisings of the wage workers of the modern proletarians. This force was shown first on a major scale in the Paris Commune, which sought to overcome the centralized authority of the state through the self-administration of the communes. It was the cause also of Marx's giving up his idea expressed in the Communist Manifesto that state economy would lead to the disappearance of class society. And the workers and soldier councils of the Russian and German revolutions of 1917 to 1923, it arose once more to a mighty and at times all mastering power. And in future, no proletarian revolutionary movement is conceivable in which it will not play a more and more prominent and finally all mastering role. It is the self-activity of the broad working masses which manifests itself in the workers' councils. Here is nothing utopian any longer. It is actual reality. In the workers' councils, the proletariat has shaped the organizational form in which it conducts its struggle for liberation. So how does the commune anticipate the form of the workers' councils? This is a historiographical problem from we must separate the concept of the commune, the ideal which the commune posited from its actuality. In other words, we must separate what is eternal in the commune from what is merely historical. Karl Korsch, writing in 1929, uh, links the ambiguity within the concept of the commune to an ambiguity in the council concept uh, at the time. And so here's an even longer quote uh, from Korsch. He says, uh, nonetheless, there remains still an unbalanced contradiction between, on the one hand, Marx's characterization of the Paris Commune as the finally discovered political form for accomplishing the economic and social self-liberation of the working class, and on the other hand, his emphasis at the same time that the suitability of the Commune for this purpose rests mainly on its formlessness that is on its indeterminateness and openness to multiple interpretations. It appears there is only one point at which Marx's inception is perfectly clear and to which he professed at this time under the influence of certain political theories he had in the meantime come up against and which were incorporated in his, this original political concept and not least under the practical impression of the enormous experience of the Paris Commune itself. While in the Communist Manifesto of 1817 to 1848, and likewise in the inaugural address to the International Workers Association in 1864, he still had only spoken of the necessity of the proletariat to conquer political power. Now the experiences of the Paris Commune provided him with the proof that the working class cannot simply appropriate the ready-made state machinery and put it into motion for its own purposes, but it must smash the existing bourgeois state machinery in a revolutionary way. This sentence has since been regarded as an essential main position and core of the whole political theory of Marxism, especially since in 1917, Lenin at once theoretically restored the unadulterated Marxian theory of the state in his work, State and Revolution, 
and practically realized it through carrying through the October Revolution as its executor. But obviously nothing positive is at all yet said about the formal character of the new revolutionary supreme state power of the proletariat with the merely negative determination that the state power cannot simply appropriate the state machinery of the previous bourgeois state for the working class and set it in motion for their own purposes. So we must ask, for which reasons does the commune in its particular determinate form represent the finally discovered political form of government for the working class, as Marx puts it in his Civil War, and as Engels characterizes it once more at great length in his introduction to the third edition of the Civil War 20 years later. Another way to state this question is to say, are the lessons of the commune purely negative, as Korch eventually uh, interprets, or is there something positive in the commune form, as Maddox seems to indicate, which will appear uh, in successive revolutions? And I guess I'd actually really uh, like to hear uh, from some of you on that question on how it appears uh, in these two texts. That's to say, um, what is historical uh, about the commune and, and what, what in the commune uh, anticipates communism or would be necessary uh, for communism to, to give you, to be specific about what I'm saying. For example, um, the fact that the working class cannot uh, appropriate state, the ready-made state machinery, that is something that will remain true, I think, for Marx uh, and for Marxists, uh, as long as such a question is meaningful to ask. That's to say, it's an eternal fact of class struggle uh, that the working class cannot do this. And there are other, you know, there are other aspects of the experience that Marx singles out this way. For example, um, the overcoming of the imperial state army. As I say, it will remain true uh, that the state army will need to be overcome and smashed uh, by revolutions. Whether you form a national guard or, or some other kind of thing or arm the workers as council communists will advocate uh, is another question and that's a historical question, but it remains true uh, that you have to deal with the army. Um, so I'm interested in, in you know, how reading both um, the Kristen Ross piece and Marx's text, uh, this appears. What is it in the, in the commune uh, that belongs to the dustbin of history? Uh, and what is it that we um, still have to reckon with? I mean, perhaps to, to be a, a, bit, a bit clearer, for example, Marx thinks it's really cool that the commune uh, has made the police uh, responsible to uh, the working class through this process of kind of delegation. Uh, and we'll get it, I wanna get into that in a, in a second. Um, but the idea is that, you know, the police aren't police because they are uh, mandated and revocable at will, uh, but we can, question that. We could say that, you know, there can be no revolutionary police. Um, and that's something that, you know, perhaps belongs to the commune uh, as such, the historical process of, of the commune. Uh, and that's something that, you know, Korsh points out, we wouldn't want to read, we wouldn't want to read this text as saying that, you know, communism requires uh, delegated uh, at will police. Uh, that's certainly not the conclusion we're supposed to draw from this text, but there's something about the process of delegation and, and uh, something about the process of delegation that uh, will, will uh, that, that Marx thinks is important. So do we have, we have some on the stack, Bruno? Yeah. Um... I'm not sure what what belongs to the dustbin of history in this, but I I was struck by the internationalism, especially as Kristen Ross explained how the embittered, defeated commune arts especially saw um, the well, their internationalism 
really was an abolition of the nation. Like it's not a federation of many communist nations because they were so, you saw so clearly that the nation was essentially, essentially colonial and not accidentally colonial. So, yeah. I was gonna say, I think that's a great example. Uh, that we could say the state must be overcome, uh, but we could you know, question whether this idea of federalist delegation, uh, which as we will see appears to really actually come from anarchism rather than uh, Marxism as such, whether we, we think that's the way to do it. Um, yeah, I think similarly, I was struck by Kristen Ross's discussion of the reclamation of the concept citizen in the context of the um, French empire. And I was curious about whether the concept citizen is something that could be similarly deployed today or whether there needs to be a different kind of concept given the way that citizenship um, in the context of you know, migration, refugee crises, and nationalism, et cetera, um, has become poison, may, may, may have become poison. So um, once again, on the internationalism. ISR Northeast Campus, y'all are up. Sorry, I forgot to unmute when I, uh, when I unvideoed. Um, yeah, again, like, I don't feel qualified to necessarily make comments on what ought to be relegated to the dustbin of history. That said, um, I mean, I think the exciting things about the council form, right, is that there's this kind of question, you know, the famous like sort of what is to be done question that's like lingered throughout the course of like the development of a, a history of uh, approaches to communism in the 20th century. Um, and a lot of them have been, have been bound up in this kind of dichotomy between like, you know, we talk about political economy, right? But it still rests on like a very specific um, dichotomy between the functions of the state and the functions of, well, the economy, right? Which we have sort of seeded the idea that it's like governed by market logics, et cetera. And maybe if you're involved in the labor movement, you, like you hope to intervene in this in one way or another. But I think like the, the council form and like the, the thinking that was done around it is this like kind of, I think intervention into like that particular distinction that's like never mm -hmm. really been fully, uh, well, you know, of course, I think many in this group would say, it's, let's be sympathetic to the idea that's never been like sort of fully explored. Um, but I think, especially as, at least from like my perspective, this, the sort of respective conversations about socialism, communism, what have you, have leaned in to this particular kind of um, kind of allocation of various powers to like the state and then to like the workers, broadly speaking, in a, in a very unimaginative way that still relies on a sort of like kind of highly like bourgeois social order, right, that has not there's not been the imagination perhaps to, to really um, kind of look at the cracks and the foundation underneath that. And I think, you know, as like anyone who's interested in history has like probably spent a long time examining not necessarily the shortcomings of like previous efforts towards like building communism, but obviously that's something I'm sure we've all thought about. And I think, being able to really like think about new ways of like both like power operating, but also like a sort of social organization that doesn't necessarily divide like governance in and the sphere of politics and cede it to this kind of institution of politics that's been like highly contoured by bourgeois social forms, as well as like the logics of the market, which even like the labor movement can't really seem to, at least in the 20th century and the 21st century, like really 
find itself outside of for some reasons that are understandable. But I think that's where like thinking about the history of the councils and particularly this kind of like historicized project that really like digs into where the roots may be um, can be like a very forward thinking project. I imagine like, yeah, a lot of people in this room are fairly like sympathetic to that idea. But I think that like distinction between like governance and the market and the way that the sort of thinking around the councils has a sort of natural vector into like a, a real critical approach to thinking through that is very useful for, for the future and not simply the dustbin of history, you know. Philip, you're up. Philip oh, Redmond. Uh, Philip. Yeah, I think that Korsh quote uh, articulates something that I was feeling as, as, as I went through it, which is on one level, the commune is an event where the government has advocated it has quit the field from fighting the Prussians and workers take over the municipal functions of the city and also presumably uh, want not to surrender the Pr Prussians in carrying the war. So you could say that the state is lying there, nobody has it and they walk in and take it. But there's obviously something else going on too that involves a rejection of the state and the creation of new forms. And I think the way uh, Kristen Ross tries to deal with this is to detach the notion of the commune from a beginning in a historical event, seeing it as a uh, beginning when the cannons were seized or when the government surrendered and people started to resist that, and to locate it in this constant ongoing discussion with these various groups that become the clubs during the commune. Uh, so you could say in a certain way that one of the essence of the not state is that this discussion continues, that the state is a form of frozen institutions uh, that make judgments like in law by saying, we can't handle this case because it's not in the constitution or whatever, you know, the, a citing protocol where the notion of a, a, a commune is that everything is on the table always uh, to discussion, I would think. Uh, as part of the process uh, that goes on, just as everybody can be recalled and revoked and so forth. I don't think those are in the dustbin of history. Sal R, go ahead. Thank you. Um, this is kind of, I guess, actually echoing what Philip uh, just went over. But um, I guess the way I'm kind of thinking about this is like, uh, like seeing the commune as, as a, you know, a reorganization of the already existing social relations, right? And that's, you know, as a Marxist, that's a pretty, you know, basic thing. But like, um, like, as opposed to seeing it as this like isolated historical event, right? That it just starts with a very specific event. It was rather like, you know, like a reorganization and reconnection of, you know, these existing, uh, you know, bourgeois social forms, um, according to a pre-existing uh, revolutionary horizon, right? That pre-existed the the you know the um, commonly uh, acknowledged beginning of the commune. So, like maybe like the um, the part of the commune or the council that doesn't fall into the dustbin of history is is more like the pro like it as like a process not necessarily the specific forms that it's overturning, right? Like, so like in this situation, like the, the, the question of the police, you know, was handled a certain way. Right now, obviously in America, like the question of the police uh, would be handled in a completely different way, right? We can think of the George Floyd rebellion in that lens. But um, anyway, just kind of that basic notion. Thank you. And last up will be uh, Ben Stork. Right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll be real quick because I think folks have really hit this. I'll try to distill my thoughts. Um, I'm basically kind of from your bringing up the police to some extent, Jasper, but um, in general, the kind of tension between the two texts in terms of Marx's insistence on uh, the revocability of all positions um, <clears throat> in the commune as sort of central to how he's thinking about it and its relationship to the state. And then Ross's. Um, kind of continual 
reference to the personas of the commune as they persist both in and after it. And so you kind of have these two figures of one of revocability and one of continuation and kind of just thinking about like how that either is a manifestation of the form ongoing or whether it is saying something more about the sort of way that persona um, is sort of inflected in history in this way so that these figures who actually scatter to some extent the nodes everywhere um, become the continuation of the historical event and, and whether that might be a bar to reconstituting it as much as um, the possibility of its continuation. So thank you. Well, that was great. Um, I think pretty much everything that people touched on is something I wanted to return to and that I have remarks, uh, you know, dealing with this in, 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 in uh, the rest of what I hope to um, talk about. I, I think it's, um, you know, interesting that marks the beginning of what we read for today describes the commune as that sphinx so tantalizing to the bourgeois mind. Uh, but it must be said that the commune has remained more of a sphinx to the communist movement uh, than to liberal democracy. This is because, uh, as Kristen Ross notes in her essay, and I have another screen share here, um, uh, as, as Kristen Ross notes in her essay on the commune, uh, <clears throat> the commune was both rallying cry uh, and the thing itself, attempting to differentiate the two or establish the moment when the one was transformed into the other, maybe beside the point. For communard Arthur Anu, uh, this is because the commune was less an uprising than the advent or affirmation of a politics. After 1871, uh, Paris had no government, gone to Bordeaux, the army in disesteem and poorly armed, generals universally held in contempt, no police on the streets. We had nothing but an anonymous power, representation by Monsieur Tout le Monde at that moment, and this is a point on which I cannot, can't insist too much because it's so important and it seems to have gone unnoticed, the commune already in fact existed. For Korsh, we might say the problem of the commune or the council system lies in disentangling the rallying cry from the thing itself. That is the riddle uh, which the sphinx of the commune poses. Some part of the commune is eternal and some part is historical. For example, it will remain forever true as long as such questions are well formed that the working class can't simply lay hold of the ready-made state machinery and wield it for its own purpose. But what do we make of the particularity of communal administration, which Marx seems to believe in this essay could have succeeded in producing communism, functioning as a lever that would uproot uh, class rule and class society. That's uh, right. Paris could resist, Paris could resist only because in consequence of the siege, it had got rid of the army and replaced it by a national guard, the bulk of which consisted of working men. This fact was now to be transformed in, into an institution. The first decree of the commune, therefore, was the suppression of the standing army and the substitution for it of the armed people. Uh, and, and so just distinguishing eternal from historical, I think we can clearly see that it is an eternal uh, goal of revolution to suppress the standing army, uh, but what it should be replaced by and what the armed people means uh, and whether that involves national guards or not, I think is a historical question. Uh, but then continuing with the Marx quote, the commune was formed of the municipal councillors chosen by universal suffrage in the various wards of the town, responsible and revocable at short terms. The majority of its members were naturally working men of acknowledged representatives of the working class. The commune was to be a working, not a parliamentary body, executive and legislative at the same time. And I think just to stop for a second, that really speaks to the point that um, ISR North made 
uh, which is which is that you know this is a kind of overcoming of the distinction between uh, the kind of executive and the legislative, and as such, a distinction between you know the economy and and politics, especially since these are bodies formed of of workmen. Uh, instead of continuing to be the agent of the central government, the police was at once stripped of its political attributes and turned into the responsible and at all times revocable agent of the commune. So were the officials of the other branches of the administration. From the members of the commune downward, the public service had to be done at workmen's wages. The vested interests and the representation allowances of the high dignitaries of state disappeared along with the high dignitaries themselves. Public functions ceased to be the private property of the tools of the central government, not only municipal administration, but the whole initiative hitherto exercised by the state was laid into the hands of the commune. And just one more uh, quote from, from the Marx about the kind of the destiny of the communal form. Uh, Marx writes, the communal regime once established in Paris and the secondary centers, the old centralized government would in the provinces too have to give way to the self-government of the producers in a rough sketch of national organization, which the commune had no time to develop. It states clearly that the commune was to be the political form of even the smallest country hamlet, and that in the rural districts, the standing army was to be replaced by a national militia with an extremely short term of service. The rural communes of every district were to administer their common affairs by an assembly of delegates in the central town. And these district assemblies were again to send deputies to the national delegation in Paris, each delegate to be at any times revocable and bound by the mandate on paratif, formal instructions of his constituents. The few but important functions which still would remain for central government were not to be suppressed, as has been intentionally misstated, but were to be discharged by communal and therefore strictly responsible agents. The unity of the nation was not to be broken, but on the contrary, to be organized by the communal constitution and to become a reality by the destruction of the state power, which claimed to be the embodiment of that unity independent of and superior to the nation itself, from which it was but a parasitic excrescence. <clears throat> the, the problem, I think, for the historiography of the commune and Marxism is that the ideas described above by Marx largely come from anarchism and from the adherence of Proudhon and Bakunin, whose presence in the commune was more massive uh, than the allies of Marx and Engels. The International Working Men's Association, or so-called First International, comprised Proudhonists, followers of Bakunin, uh, and those allied with Marx and Engels, as well as many others. In the years preceding the commune, Marx and Engels had waged, waged a successful struggle against the Proudhonists in the international and had gained a certain influence. Mutualism was out, uh, but Bakunin's collectivism, which imagined revolution as a free association of free associations, was still very much under discussion. Bakunin had argued vociferously for a rising of the French before, before during, and after the Franco-Prussian War, and with members of the international had organized a short-lived uprising in Lyon, where the Lyon Commune was declared and the red flag raised. Marx and Engels thought such efforts were certain to fail and argued against them. The French would lose the war and the empire would end, but whether the French working class was sufficiently organized to overcome the limits imposed by 1848 was unclear. From the standpoint of Bakunin, Marx's text is a shocking about face and also a face-saving maneuver. And yet Marx had for a long time declared himself partisan of free association. In Capital, he suggests that mis the mystifications of the commodity form can only be dissolved by free association. Uh, he writes, the veil is not removed from the countenance of the social life process, i.e. the process of material production until it becomes production by freely associated men and stands under their conscious and planned control. This may be why Marx focuses on those positively defined aspects of the commune, which retain the negative power of free association. Marx singles out three aspects of communal administration by delegates. These delegates must be responsible. That is, they carry out specific mandates and instructions. 
They must be revocable at will by the delegating body, and they must be workers themselves. This last point needs a bit of explication. Marx describes the communal administration as leveling all labor, including administrative labor, which is done at workmen's wages. What's important here, I think, is that there is no gain to be had from serving in this way, and such service becomes a responsibility uh, rather than a right or privilege. Implicitly, too, the idea is that administrative labor can be made transparent and comprehensible to workmen or workwomen so that they can serve as delegates. The point is that they remain uh, workers while they administer. I believe that Marx sees these as eternal aspects of freely associated labor, since they derive logically from free association. Even if freely associated labor did not delegate, if it did, it would have to do so under these terms, or the association would no longer be free. Delegates must be responsible, revocable, and the positions they inhabit should be potentially inhabitable by all. Even if no wages are paid, that's to say, if goods were distributed on demand, uh, as happens in some visions of communism, then it would still be the case that there is no benefit to be gained by serving. This does not answer at all the questions of what they are delegated to or who is delegated or how these kinds of structures um, link up to form larger bodies. That all remains uh, open-ended. The commune was not organized within workplaces for the most part. And in fact, its economic measures are rather unimpressive. Its administration was by no means purely proletarian. Furthermore, its members were delegated to positions that retained elements of the bourgeois state. A mandated police force is still a police force. But Marx emphasizes that the commune was an expansive form. These principles make it so that any delegation which violates free association would need to be recalled and reformed. This might be a matter of the content of the rule. The police, for example, to whom delegation is an impossibility logically, since the power of the police can't be revoked at will. That's to say, a police officer wouldn't be a police officer if you know, they pointed their gun at you and you decided to revoke their power rather than uh, be shot. There are strong differences between the vision of communism as workers' councils and communism as communal organization. But in almost every case, council communists imagine something like what Marx has described. Workers' councils elect responsible delegates, revocable at will, who are workers themselves. This last point became the key point of contention between left communists and social democrats or Bolshevists during the German Revolution, uh, which we'll, we will eventually discuss. Only some councils restricted their membership to workers. And so when delegates were selected to, term, to determine the fate of the councils, only a percentage of the delegates were actually workers. The Council Communists wanted to refound the councils with different delegates, explicitly proletarian uh, and revolutionary, i.e. actually responsible to the revolutionary workers and mandated, mandated to carry out councillor revolution. This principle of proletarian selection absent from the commune might be seen as reconciling Marx's notion of the dictatorship of the proletariat uh, with communal organization. There may then be something logically obvious about this form, a logical conclusion at which workers' councils declaring their autonomy uh, based around self-organization will arrive. I'm not sure, however, uh, that this really tells us what, the com what a commune is, um, what, a co what the commune was or what a commune is, uh, since this was a perspective and unrealized vision, there's a difference between the Paris Commune and the fully realized communal form of administration, which its partisans wanted to realize. Um, there's a difference between the rallying cry and the thing itself. This difference is part of the universal appeal of the Commune, its universalism, which in some ways sits at odds with it as a form of self-organization. A Commune is expansive, projective, uh, but it does not begin as what it will eventually become, like a virus multiplying. As Marx notes, if the commune was thus the true representative of all the healthy elements of French society, and therefore the truly national government, it was at the same time as a working men's government, as the bold champion of the emancipation of labor, emphatically international. Within sight of the Prussian army that had annexed to Germany two provinces, two French provinces, 
the commune annexed to France, the working people all over the world. I selected Kristen Ross's text as reading for today because it addresses this aspect extensively. The way the commune as rallying cry functioned, rallying workers beyond Paris's besieged walls, but also for decades after and arguably still. Ross draws attention to the idea attested by many participants that the commune represented the emergence of a universal republic, which would overcome all national borders and boundaries through communal cooperation. The commune was an audacious act of internationalism because its constituents and leaders were frequently not French at all, uh, not only because its constituents and leaders were not French at all, but because its adherents and partisans were scattered all over the world. The commune had an appeal beyond Paris for symbolic and practical reasons. It was a model, but also a historical event that seemed to betoken universal liberation. Uh, indeed, in reckoning with the concept of the commune, the political imaginary of the commune, we must note that it persists implausibly 150 years later. The number of uprisings designated with the term commune grows, and the concept remains important within communist theory. Um, is there something to uh, this persistence? Is there something to what people call uh, the commune? That's to say, is the commune a form? If so, it is not one that can spread, but one that must be overcome, right? Because it is, it is a insurrectionary form where its partisans are both kind of inside and outside of it. Uh, it is a riddle that a successful revolution answers, but certainly not something to, to generalize. Uh, and here I'd, I'd like to finish uh, just by reading a little bit from uh, the work that I'm writing about these, these questions in which I um, attempt to theorize what a commune is um, as a way of getting into the story of the Workers' Council. The emancipation of the working classes must be, as we know from history and from Marx and Engels, conquered by the working class itself. The class of proletarians must organize itself, must self-organize, for who else could be trusted to abolish class society and class rule, but the class which cannot rule? In this sense, self-organization is presupposed by all meaningful class struggle, the prelude of insurrection, if not revolution. But whose is the self of self-organization? What is the working class itself? It cannot be the sum of each worker themselves as organized by capitalism, for that is by definition not self-organization, but other organization. Nor can it be the product of all workers organized for each other, for that is simply communism, leaving no room for another class and thus no room for classes or class as such. It must be the difference that some section of the class makes when it removes itself from its organization by capitalism and for the ruling class. Self-organization is, is never then the class itself, but rather some fraction of the class subtracted from given relations. To organize for themselves and by themselves, the members of some projective collectivity must do so with each other, but most importantly, against their already existing organization by and for capital. The proletariat steps forward by stepping back out of the existing organization of the world, but it never does so wholly. The proletariat is always only some proletarians. Self-organization does not unite the working class, but splits it. In so doing, however, it betokens the abolition of class, not the unity of proletarians, but real human community. Split upon split, self-organization inscribes the division between classes within the proletarian class in order that all divisions might be trespassed. Against a self-organizing fraction, the unity of the class presents itself as, a, as the subordination of each member of the class to their identity as exploited worker or dispossessed proletarian. The workers occupy their factories, but it is never all the workers nor all the factories, nor when a show of hands is taken, are the occupiers even the workers. Liberation means breaking with both the owners and the arbiters of labor power, breaking with the class of rulers, as well as the class of the ruled, the owners and their delegates and representatives within the class who enable the buying and selling of labor in bulk. 
But by the same measure, this exceptionality is also always a form of representation, if not substitution. In organizing by themselves, such self-organizing fractions are rarely entirely selfish in their motives, are rarely only strictly for themselves. This is why it is usually some moment of individual mournability that sets things off. The police kill a worker, or some sections of worker, or some section of workers are fired and then everyone reacts for themselves and others all at once. The workers occupy the factories in May 68, for example, but their demands are both selfish and not. They stand with the students against de Gaulle and for themselves. They inspire and are inspired by other proletarians near and far, with and without jobs, inside and out any sociological bound we might draw. The rebels of the Paris Commune, of the Shanghai Commune, of Berlin in 1918, and Bologna in 1977, and Argentina in 2001, act for themselves and others, not just Paris or Shanghai or Bologna or Buenos Aires or Cairo, but Paris and Shanghai and Bologna and Buenos Aires and Cairo, in as much as they act in such a way as to make possible a later overcoming of class itself, then they act on behalf of all proletarians, even and especially those not yet born into dispossession. In this manner, to the extent that they introduce something new into the class struggle, something imitable, they inspire sympathy, solidarity, and imitation far and wide. This is the secret meaning of the term commune, which is always a fragment of some communism not yet established, a part without a whole that nonetheless treats itself as whole, a communist Paris without a communist France, a city center turned into an armed encampment, an occupied factory made emblem of proletarian autonomy as such. As without, so within. The self of self-organization is spectral, dissolving at any moment into the frayed ends of individual selves. This is why all attempts to represent, to count, to fix the revolutionary camp in place, however defined, must fail. In collective action, people together believe what individually they doubt, making the boundaries of such actions indiscernible. Self-organization is a kind of fanatic reason. Something is rational because in collective action, people make it so. From the revolutionary red interval of 1917 to 1923, through to the 1960s and 1970s, this is the conclusion we are led to draw from the shocking reversals and betrayals of the greatest revolutionary proletarian successes. In Germany in 1918, in the wake of the Russian Revolution, this dynamic was perhaps posed most clearly, if only because there the most massively inertial institution of the workers' movement, the SPD, confronted one of the largest fields of proletarian revolutionary self-organization yet seen. Communists like Rosa Luxemburg, aligned with the Spartacist League and its successors, hoped to outmaneuver the left wing of capital by drawing upon the substantial support demonstrated by the workers and soldiers councils of November, spontaneous formations that had ended a world war and toppled the German empire, but in batting, workers are counted modulo capital as individual chunks of variable capital, heads of house, citizens, and consumers. A kind of Heisenbergian uncertainty attends self-organization then. Some subject, some specter makes itself felt, makes its presence known, but cannot be represented or observed directly, in fact dissipates when one attempts to formalize or gather it to body the ghost and constitution. This is simply another way of saying that the object of self-organization is not or cannot be the, the securing of rights, for that is organization by and of another. Thus is the moment of contract, of settlement, always a scandal for struggles that insist on self-organization, whether Picateros or Zapatistas, whether in the zone La Defandra or the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. Self-organization cannot become self-rule, autonomy, without becoming the domination of each individual by some abstract notion of the collective, some mediation, substitution, or representation. As atomized, penniless, and market-bound individuals, proletarians are weak. But collectivization is no guarantee against heteronomy, since capital treats labor as variable capital, bought in bundles that might be individuals or groups, a real valued function that might as well be one worker or 1,000 or 12.57 workers, whatever that means. 
The collective action of a movement can be absorbed as a movement of variable capital, as a flow of labor power reproduced at a given capacity. <clears throat> this explains the sudden reversals experienced when it comes time to settle up. In June of 68 in Paris, the mass of the workers greet the negotiations between the leaders of their respective classes with an indifference equal to the ferocity with which they downed their tools in the great strike of May. In Italy's creeping May, the rank and file organizations which brought, which brought the apparatus of Italian industry to halt with ease dissipate just as quickly in the face of negotiations between the classes. The informality of self-organization cannot be banished, cannot be formalized, no matter the tyrannies imposed by such lack of structure. That lack of structure, or rather that refusal of structure, derives from the antinomies of the class struggle. For this reason, even though self-organization is the very presupposition of revolutionary action, as and if the revolution unfolds, it becomes an obstacle which the revolution must overcome. Uh, and here I'm quoting from Terry Communiste. Perhaps limit is the better term. For it is not what self-organization does that hinders the revolution, but what it doesn't do. The self-organizing fraction cannot simply subtract itself for it remains materially dependent. That way lies suicide. Nor can it simply transact or contract for that would be organization by and through the enemy class. It must extract from capital and retract from the state what is necessary for each self to organize itself with others according to its own desire, which is to say nearly everything. The self of self-organization is projective, prospective, aspirational, not the real individuals themselves, but a kind of spirit that hovers near, but only near. It doesn't exist here and now, and therefore can only look on itself strictly as itself, as worker in auto plant, parent in neighborhood, citizen in city, as in fact the self of another, as something to be abolished. Self-organization always fights its way into a corner where the options are suicide, compromise, or total victory, which is to say the overcoming of opposition between self and other in the sense used here, the abolition of classes. Absent the production of communism, of classless society, such a self presents itself as vengeful spirit, appears most clearly when destroying the things of the world. And uh, I think I'll end there for today. And we can just take questions and uh, general commentary from here. All right. Um, I, don't, I think we'll, we'll maybe end there. Jasper, if you wanted to say anything else, uh, you're muted at the moment, but um, looks like you're, you're shaking your head. So. Um, Thanks everyone for being with us. Um, we, we mentioned in the chat, but the next meeting is going to be November 13th. Um, and yeah, there was a, um, a message about doing breakout groups. I think that's definitely something we can talk about for, for next time. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we want to like keep this format fairly open. So if you do have more su suggestions about how to um, navigate group engagement on Zoom and all of that, you know, I think we're, we're definitely open to all that as well. So yeah. Um, uh, thanks for uh, being here. And yeah, check out Jasper um, on Twitter, um, Outside the Agitator. You can find uh, Red May uh, at Red May Seattle. Um, and the document will also be a living document. So uh, the dates and everything, as well as the readings will be on um, the Google Doc that we've shared. Uh, we'll continue to do all of that for um, the next meeting as well. But um, between now and November 13th, if you're not already in a reading group, uh, find some friends and um, try and, and read some of the text together, find a time to meet and chat. There are a number of different people uh, right now that are all in uh, other reading groups that are discussing the text sort of in between the um, uh, online sessions. So uh, we encourage you to do that as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, unless there's anything else, um, Thanks again. Thanks to Jasper. Thanks to all of you. Uh, we'll see you all in a month.